Hello, everyone, and thanks for tuning in. You know, we've often heard that life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forward. So that means that wisdom is a treasure. And today we have one in Alan Fox, who's joining us, who's had such a, an, an eclectic life from law and accounting to poetry and health to entrepreneurship. He just released a book called People Tools. And, uh, and I just heard there's something else that's coming, which is very exciting. And he's also the founding ad- editor of Rattle. So, Alan, I'm so happy that you've joined us today. Well, thank you, Maul. I'm really happy to be with you. Before we get to the tools, Alan, you've lived, and as we just talked about, you're living such a great life. When a promising young entrepreneur or person asks you, what has been the secret to your successful life? What do you tell her? Mo, well, I think the biggest secret and I do talk about this in People Tools, is, is this. I always know that I can solve the problem. In other words, confidence. And I'm not saying that I always do solve the problem, but I am always confident and I always you know, dig in and, and just do it. And I think when you couple confidence with uh, willingness to work hard uh, and sometimes long hours, I think that's what you need to be a successful entrepreneur. How do you how do you grow? The, they don't teach you that at school. They don't teach you the confidence thing at school. You have to go out and earn your stripes. Do you have some insight, Alan, into what contributes you know the greatest to you increasing your confidence? Well, what what increases uh, confidence is success, and the problem it's kind of a catch twenty two. You need confidence to be successful. Uh, you know, it's like uh, like in high school asking a girl out. If you if you call a girl and say, I, I don't suppose you want to go out with me, well, that wasn't very confident, and the answer is probably going to be no. On the other hand, once you've done something a lot and are successful, when I first started syndicate real estate, I sent out uh, something to five five people, and two of them hated it. Two of them didn't invest, and one said, Well, you know, you and your law partner, two young guys starting out. I'll, I'll encourage you to invest five thousand dollars. This was not a ringing endorsement, so I guess it's, it's something internal. You just have to know that you are going to succeed. So you know, we retooled it and, and did it again and, and made it better. And you, you have to keep uh, keep plugging away. Was there a time when you felt like that trigger for you, that confidence lever, really just ignited you to say, "Hey, the only way to to, to do is to try." Absolutely. And I think it took me, well, I started out in business when I was about 27, and uh, I think it took me to about 35 when I just really, I realized that meetings didn't start until I started them, and they didn't finish until I said, okay, let's, let's go on something else. So you know, it does take a while to, to have the experience, and, uh, and that builds your confidence. You have to have confidence in the first place that you can do it, uh, which uh, is an important aspect of people tools. And um, and then you have to do it and build your confidence. So one uh, ex- good experience leads to more confidence. Alan, one of the greatest insights that you get, if, if people don't get anything out of this book other than this, obviously we don't have time to talk about all 54 rules, but right up front, the thing that I admired the most is you say that I didn't set out to get rich, I set out to work hard. It's really Absolutely. profound. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, uh, most people often talk to me about, I want to make a lot of money. And I say, well, you know, that's fine. That's okay. Uh, I have nothing against money. I think it's wonderful. However, if your goal is money, you probably aren't going to do as well what it takes to get there. You know, in other words, you have to enjoy the journey. You have to enjoy what you're doing. If you get rich and you have a lot of money in five years or 10 years or 30 years, that's great, but you spent a long time getting there. You might as well enjoy it. And I always think people should do what they're good at and what they enjoy. And and focus on that. And focus on, on, on your principles, on your product, on good service or outstanding service. And you'll get there. The, the money will follow. And that's and it's easier said than done. But for you personally, how has your relationship evolved with money? You started out, as you mentioned, with very little you know, fortunately, life's been good. How has that evolved? Well, you know, in people tools, I talk about what you're afraid of. And, you know, for example, I'm afraid of heights. I, I don't like to stand on cliffs or, you know, in tall buildings looking down. And 
you know, I'm never going to be a steel worker on the you know 80th floor of some new building. On the other hand, for whatever reason, I've never been afraid of money. And I know people, including people I'm rather close to, and they just won't talk about money. There are They are just terrified. So I think you have to, in terms of money, you have to desensitize yourself from being afraid of it and and really be comfortable with money. Be uh, I once met a woman, I said, uh, uh, she got a new job. Well, I like to know what people are earning because I run a business. I pay salaries, so I want to know what the salaries are out there. And I said to this woman, well, what is your earning? A new job. She said, well, I wouldn't even tell my mother that. I said, well, I won't tell your mother either, so how much are you earning? And she told me. So, you know, again, you have to be confident. You know, that's interesting. It's an interesting point you bring up because having kind of been brought up in the world of finance, it, it is actually the great majority of people who are have some type of fear of money. What do you think causes that fear, Alan? And what does it take for somebody like you to, to totally detach from it? Well, I, I think our fears come both internally and, you know, fears from, from our environment growing up. And, uh, you know, my, my second wife came to me one day. She said, um, uh, I think my parents need financial help. I said, well, okay, uh, what makes you feel that? And she said, well, I, I don't know. I said, well, how much do they have in the bank? Well, I don't know. How much does your father earn? I don't know. I, I, I said, Susan, I, I, see, in her family, they didn't talk about money. Yeah. So, you know, it becomes this, this scary thing that people don't talk about. And how are you going to learn about it if your family doesn't talk about it? It gives you the message. So if your parents are afraid of it, probably you're going to be afraid of it. So I think you have to overcome that if you're lucky enough to be in a family where it's kind of discussed. You know, in my family, for example, sex was never discussed, never, ever. So, you know, I had to learn about it myself. And um, I think that when it's talked about, and I would say take courses um, and, and you know, talk to people who are comfortable with money. Yeah, which it's a, that's a really, really a great point. As I said, I can't get into all the rules. I've picked my favorites. I want to go through a couple of them, and I want to get your perspective on them. Right off the bat, I'm such a believer that you've got to participate in the game to have a chance to win. Something holds people back, Alan, and I know it's probably fear. You say, go buy a ticket or you can't have a chance to win. Absolutely. And, and one of the best people tools is buy a ticket. So if you want to win the lottery, you've got to buy a ticket. And uh, when I was practicing law, I started getting into real estate, and my law partner was, was scared. And uh, I said, George, you know, our net worth between us is $15,000. Suppose we run it up to a million dollars, and we lose it all. So we've gone from 15000 to nothing. I mean, not a big deal. Suppose we run it up to a million and keep it. That would be pretty good. And But it, it, it just scared him too much, and eventually he went and found another law firm and, uh, and, and left. Um, so, again, um, you, have to, you have to be willing to lose in order to win. You know, People Tools talks about that in terms of risk taking. You know, take a chance. You you you, you got to take some chances. And you know, buying a lottery ticket. I'm not recommending the lottery per se, but you know, you got to buy a ticket in order to win. You've got to go into business. You've got to make an investment in order to have a profitable investment. If you don't make the investment in yourself, and I think the best investment you can make is in yourself, in your knowledge, in your experience, uh, in your contacts with people, and getting along with people. So, you know, buying a ticket means participating in life and, and honing your skills and getting as much help as you can. Well, it's an, so fear at some point touches everybody's life. How have you learned to cope with it? Obviously, your former partner, partner didn't want to do it, but how have you learned? Because you've taken your chances have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So you've built some pretty good shops. That's true. And um, and I think what you are saying is, is a very good idea, and People Tool talks about that also. You know, you start you start smaller. When I was uh, when I was first in business, uh, I was trying to do a deal which would have taken five years to put together, and I met a banker, and he said, "Alan, he said, you know, if you do a deal for five years and it fails, you've wasted five years. If you do deals that are small and you can do two a month, you know, if one of those fails, so what?" So I think you have to start smaller. You take prudent risks, not 
you know, not uh, not not dumb risks. You're not gonna, you know, bet uh, you know everything you have. Although some people do and are successful at it, but many people aren't. So I believe in in, in prudent risks and um, and building uh, as you go, and then changing course as you go. Al, my 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 best learning personally learning tool has always been a great question. So with your question mark, what cues you to use it? <laughs> well, I tell the story of people tools. Uh, I say it's about somebody else. Actually, it's about me. I arrived in Milan. That's good to know. And I, and I yeah, and, you know, and for some reason, I had the car. I didn't have a map, and I tried to find in Milan, which is a big city, the hotel. And my wife thought I was crazy, and I probably was. I drove around for an hour and a half. I couldn't find the hotel, I, I, and I never did ask. I finally hired a taxi, and I said, you know, would you, I'll follow you, drive to, the, to this hotel. Um, and so I wasn't very good at asking. And I find that, you know, other people are happy to help. Other people know more than I do. They have more experience and expertise. Like on People Tools book, I, I've, I've never put out a book before, so... You know, I have a publisher, a publicist, and they know what they're doing, so I ask them. Well, I ask them a lot of questions on, you know, what are you going to do, why are you going to do it, et cetera. And I, I think, uh, you know, men have the reputation of not asking enough, especially asking directions. And uh, I, I, I think asking is a great way to build a team and to get information that you need. Uh, amongst other things about directions, right? We can go on and on with that, but I know you have favorite questions, but do you have a pattern in how you formulate these questions? Because I know in business that great leaders ask great questions. I try more to ask, I try to get to the essence. If you exist on, on the surface uh, all of your life, you're, you're not going to get too far. You want to know the real motivations of people, why we do what we do, why you do what you do. And that's why, for example, uh, I say the, the most important people to was Socrates, know thyself. If you know what you're good at, what you're not good at, what you like, what you don't like, then you can be more effective at, at being where you should be. So, you know, you've got to know yourself first, and then... Then you'll know what you need to know so you can ask the right questions. You're, you're, you're a master at building relationships. Describe what a great relationship looks like because you can't survive personally or professionally without them. Absolutely. You know, my brother uh, took a course with Peter Drucker, the management guru, years ago. And uh, my brother told me that Drucker said one thing which has always stuck with me, which is have people do what they're good at in relationships. And I have many, many business relationships, and some people are outgoing and salesmen, but you know, if you want them to do an accounting, good luck. So in people tools, you know, we talk about having people do what they're good at. You should do what you're good at. Um, you know, you're you're doing an interview, so you know you've had experience, and you you enjoy that, and you're good at that. So yeah, 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 you have to um, uh, find that out for yourself. Alan, I promised myself that I want to cover at least 12 tools with you. So if, if it's right. okay with you, I'm going to the, I'm gonna just mention my favorites in the book. And then obviously, with all due respect, there are many, many more. But can you just tell me the first things that come to mind when we go through a couple of these? Because I want to make sure people understand what's there. The first one, positive self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, be optimistic in your prophecies. And is optimism sometimes illusion or, or, I mean, because some people say that, right? So when I talk to people about this specific tool, sometimes they tell me, but that could be, these rosy pictures could be illusional. Well, that's true. And that's why my, my philosophy uh, for people tools is expect the best. So it's be optimistic and plan for the worst. So if something bad happens, you're ready for it. Shrink the glass. Sure. Everybody talks about is the glass half full? That would be uh, 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 an optimist or half empty. That's a pessimist. I say whatever's in the glass, get a glass and that, that is small enough to fill the glass so that you're happy. The purpose of life is to be happy. That's the first sentence in my book. When you have enough joy in your life, what else do you really need? That is also the last sentence in People Tools. So, you know, shrink the glass. Be happy with, with what you have. You're there. You're at somebody's wedding, you might as well enjoy the food or the company or the ambience or, you know, 
or reading something on your iPad if you're not enjoying the wedding itself. So drink the glass. Alan, you're you're around lots of people of all kinds, primarily very successful people. What do you think, what holds them back from being happy? Because notoriously, people are not. I would say this, and, and you know, you're right. I think that most people are working toward uh, a goal and they feel they will only be happy when they reach their destination. Well, you know, if I was taking a train from Los Angeles to New York and then it was a four day trip, getting to New York is, is, is not the big deal. The big deal is enjoying the ride. So you've got to enjoy the ride. You've got to focus on every day. Look, you only have today. Make the most of it. If you're always living in the future, tomorrow, you know, when I'm rich, that's grass is greener. You know, when I'm rich, when I move to somewhere, when I get this job, when I get married, when I get divorced, then I'll be happy. Be happy today because if you don't have the habit, and it's, it's, it's a habit, so you have to practice. And be happy today with what you have today. Enjoy what you're doing today, moving to it. I enjoy the process of money. And, you know, if you have a lot of it accumulated, that's fine. But the process is fun for me. And that's, uh, that's I think, one thing which leads to success. Al, when things don't go your way, how do you, whether it's a misstep, whether it's a mistake, whatever, tell me how you've learned to deal with it. Well, <laughs> I'm glad you asked that, Mo, because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a perfectionist. I want everything to be perfect all the time. And that is not the way the world works. In fact, I don't think I've ever lived a day in my life without making a mistake of some sort. So I think that uh, yeah, I regard myself, and I, I, I have a people who will get past perfect. You, 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 you don't have to be perfect. You're not going to be perfect. You can aim for it, but you got to settle for what you get and, and be happy with it. So I think if you see the, the people tools are in your mind. You know, for a carpenter, you have a hammer and a saw, and that's what you use. Uh, and, and with people, you got to use what's in yourself, in your mind, in your heart, and, uh, you know, go for it. So, so let's assume you don't get perfection, right? But wouldn't you assume that your consumers want perfection? I want to go into that apartment building, and I want it to be exactly what I wanted. Certainly, there are missteps, right? And there are things that happen along the way, but... So from a consumer's perspective, how do you come to grips with that? Well, Mo, I think what we're talking about here is, uh, look, happiness to me is, the, is, 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 is when you get what you expect or better. So you could either, uh, if, if, if I expect to have a good dinner at a restaurant and it turns out to be very good, I'm happy. If I expect an outstanding dinner at a restaurant and it turns out to be very good, I'm disappointed. So with customers, one thing you do, one thing I do in real estate investments is reduce the expectations. If I think an investment is going to return 10%, I'm going to tell the investors 8%. And years ago, one of the managers said, Al, you're always doing better than you you predict. I said, well, I'd rather do that than worse. So, you know, reduce expectations, including your own expectations. Tell me the four C's. The four C's, yeah. uh, A friend of mine wrote a play on this. And uh, the, the uh, analogy he uses is you're in an airplane and you run out of fuel, and what do you do? Well, first of all, you have to confess. You have to confess that you're lost. You need help. And then uh, after you uh, confess, you climb. You climb in the airplane. You, you find out what's going on. You, you get more information. And then you contact. You know, contact the ground station. Contact somebody who can help you. And then the final C is commit. You got to commit to a course of action. If you're in an airplane, you know you're you're going to come down at some point because you're out of fuel. So you got to uh, you got to commit to a course of action to an airport, to a road, or whatever. Uh, so the four C's are um, confess, climb, contact, and commit. And that's just as relevant personally as it is in business. So, absolutely, especially the commit part. And, and the, you know the. the Things that are tough is confess. Confess your loss. Confess you have a problem. That's tough. And then committing to a course of action can also be tough because you're foregoing all other possibilities. But you know, in your life, you you I, I get the greatest reward when I make the greatest commitment. And by that, to make it easy, one you know, if I commit, if I if I invest a thousand dollars in a stock, and it doubles, 
I make a thousand dollars, which is you know not that big an amount of money. And I always wish I invested, you know, twenty thousand sure. dollars. So you got to you got to commit. You can't overcommit because you know if you lose everything, that's uh, that's not too good either. But I think the confessing and committing are quite important. Alan, I, I, let me divert for one second because I, I don't want our time to get away. A lot of people I assume sure. listening. I mentioned rattle. They don't know that you're a poet or you're into poetry. How how does that help you in life? Just whether it's reading poetry, writing poetry. You know, dialogue and around poetry. Well, you know, I was I was I was talking to a trial attorney the other day, who said that on the way to court, trial attorneys like to listen to like an audio book or something to take their mind off their case. And I think you have to have perspective on yourself. And poetry is succinct, which I like very much. You know, I don't have to read 500 pages to get the point. I can read half a page or two pages. And and poetry, uh, at, at its best, um, is, has insights and inspiration. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty emotional. So uh, with a rattle, uh, when a poem is submitted, uh, you know, if I smile or laugh out loud, I'm taking that poem. Or if I have tears in my eyes at the end, I'm taking the poem. It's a, it's a necessary break from from the the single minded pursuit of business how, how often do you read or are you engaged in some type of activity involving poetry on uh, poetry well with rattle i would say you know every week i, I generally go over poems uh, once a week or once every other week with my poetry editor and we have contests and we uh, we have a good time with it so it's it's a big part of your life um, yes, I would say so. Yeah, yeah. Right. Poetry, literature. It, b- being in real estate, you're a master at leverage. Talk to me about leverage within the context of people tools. Well, good question. Within the context of people tools, uh, you know, leverage is, uh, well, it works many ways. First, in, in real estate, we talk about leverage in terms of the down payment. So, in other words, we want to buy a million dollar property with as little down as we possibly can. And so uh, that's leverage in that sense. Also, I'm fond of energy leverage, meaning get the most out of the least uh, time or energy input. So if you get other people doing things, that's, uh, that's uh, the, the way uh, you should go. And also, in terms of leverage, you know, if you have something someone else wants and they have something you want, then you, you do your exchange and um, uh, in terms of leverage, you can find it everywhere. Uh, just find out what the other person wants and find out what you have that, uh, that they want. And uh, hopefully find out, uh, find a person who has a lot of what you want. If this person has a lot of real estate and they want to get rid of it, and I want to buy it, uh, if they want to get rid of a lot of properties at once, then uh, I have some leverage because uh, that's what they want and I can buy a lot of properties at once. You talked earlier about your brother and Peter Drucker and about letting people do what they're good at. You talk about catch them being good. Is is that from the same thinking? Is that the more that I look at the good in people, the better they are? Well, that was what I was studying in the School of Education at USC, uh, catch them being good, and I had young children at the time. And when I was raised, my father never complimented me. He thought I'd you know, get a big head and not, not try anymore. And psychology shows that's just uh, the wrong way to go about it. If you praise people, you know, if somebody says, hey, uh, Mo, you did a great job on that interview, well, you know, you're going to feel good about it. You're going to like the person. You're going to want to do more interviews. So catch children being good. You know, when, when, you're, when your kid comes in with a with the crayon drawing, you know, you're not going to say, oh, the tree isn't perfect, you know, or trees are green, not blue. Praise the kid for trying. And modern research, by the way, is clearly indicating that children do better when they are encouraged and told that for, for working hard, for working at a project, rather than just getting results. So catch other people being good. I try to catch my employees being good as much as I possibly can, uh, which frankly is not something I'm real good at because you know, I'm more like my father and more ready to criticize. So I've had to learn that that isn't what works real well. And, and how about things are only things? Is that kind of... Your, your tilt to saying, you know, life goes on regardless of whether something great happens or something that's not so great happens, you got to move on because all you got is now. Well, in a sense, but things are only things 
you know, I, I grew up and money was very important. Things are important. And a car is important. And my first car, a new car, a VW Bug, was sideswiped and had scratches on it. And I was upset for a month. And I decided, you know, things, the car, uh, these things be fixed or replaced. People can't. So in terms of my emotional energy, I say that for people. And, you know, I'm not going to get that involved in, in being upset about things. Which is something that all of us ought, ought, ought to learn. Alan, I want to end with this. You're, you're an entrepreneur. If you were starting out today, what would be some of the more important ideas that you would pursue? I think you, you have to pursue things on the cutting edge uh, that are new in terms of computers, technology. I also think there's a huge uh, opportunity, Mo, um, and this is not in people tools, but uh, this is a good question. And that is international uh, things. You know, I do business internationally, and now with emails and cell phones, it's easy to do. When I was growing up, to call, you know, Europe, you had to get a special operator, and it took forever and cost a fortune. So I think focus on international stuff uh, because I think that's uh, the wave of the future. And is there one particular question, if you were an entrepreneur starting out, you, that you would repeatedly ask yourself to try to get there? Um, well, I'd be asking myself where I want to go and how am I doing in getting there. In other words, how is the process going? You've got to evaluate the process uh, all the time. And that's, again, what, what People Tools is, uh, is really largely about. Well, tell them how, how do they find People Tools and how do they learn about Alan the poet, Alan the author. Obviously, Alan the entrepreneur is, uh, is everywhere. Right. Well, we have our website, peopletoolsbook.com. And you can write to me, uh, Alan, A-L-A-N, at peopletoolsbook. Uh, and dot uh, com and the book is available on Amazon. We're going to be uh, number seven on the New York Times bestseller list uh, this coming uh, Sunday. Uh, we had a great debut, uh, and actually, People Tools is doing well in India, Canada, uh, France, and Germany. So, uh, but be happy to talk to people. Email. I'm I'm great at emails. I I love to email people. So you know, get in touch with me at Alan at PeopleToolsBook dot com. You're exceptional, my friend. Thank you so much for making the time. Thanks, Mo. It's been a pleasure.